talk, I will be focusing on the definition of bradycardia, determine some of the pitfalls which may lead us to an erroneous diagnosis of bradycardia, I will run through the causes of bradycardia, and then touch on the different types of bradycardia, following which I will show you my approach to bradycardia, and conclude with several case studies to reinforce some of the principles covered in this talk. So bradycardia is defined as a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute, but this does not take into account physiological states, such as being an athlete during sleep or senile degeneration. You can imagine an asymptomatic avid marathon runner to have a resting heart rate of 45 beats per minute, which may not warrant further investigations. Also, our heart rate drops during periods of rest and sleep, and a nocturnal heart rate ranging around 40 is well within physiological limits. So even though the definition is a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute, we need to take into account physiological states. Factitious bradycardia is probably one of the most common reasons for bradycardia referrals from primary care. It is important to note that automatic blood pressure machines can give erroneous readings in the presence of ectopics. However, this can be easily overcome by taking a manual blood pressure along with pulse rate, or if there is an ECG machine, this will confirm or refute the diagnosis of bradycardia. There are numerous causes of bradycardia. Earlier on, we touched on physiological states, which can be left alone and do not need further workup. The other causes can be divided into extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Extrinsic causes include drug most commonly beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and sometimes antiarrhythmics and sedatives. Electrolytes, some of the likely culprits are potassium and magnesium, endocrine abnormalities, especially hypothyroidism, hypothermia, autonomic or neurological issues such as neurocardiogenic events or more commonly called vasovagal episodes, obstructive sleep apnea, carotid sinus hypersensitivity or CSH where patients have a classical history of giddiness or syncope during shaving or head turning, multi-system atrophy as part of a Parkinson's plus syndrome or neurotoxic chemotherapy. Intrinsic causes are factors which are a result of processes directly occurring inside the heart. In elderly folks, this is most commonly degenerative or senile degeneration of the conduction system. Ischemic heart disease, where sinus node dysfunction can come from a disease from a sinus nodal artery ischemia or complete heart block for AV nodal artery ischemia. There can also be surgical trauma from valvular replacement. There can also be infiltrative heart disease such as sarcoidosis or amyloidosis, connective tissue diseases, infections, especially rheumatic fever or endocarditis, other neurological disorders such as muscular dystrophy or genetic or familiar conditions. And these are some of the potential culprit genes listed here. This is a flow chart showing what we've just discussed. Basically, this is a good way to dichotomize our thinking to recall all the potential causes of bradycardia. In terms of the types of bradycardia, there are only two main types. You can think of it as either a sinus node dysfunction or AV block. And AV blocks can be AV nodal or more distally involving the his Purkinje system. Sinus node dysfunction can manifest as sinus bradycardia, sinus pause, or a rest from SA nodal Wenckebach or block. There can also be chronotropic incompetence or tachybrady syndrome most often associated with atrial fibrillation and post-conversion pauses. For AV block, there is first, second and third degree AV blocks. I personally don't like the name of first degree AV block because it is not actually a block but rather just a prolonged PR interval. Second degree AV blocks can be type 1, which is Wenckebach AV block where we see progressive PR prolongation followed by a P wave that is not conducted. Or type 2, where the PR interval is fixed each time there is AV conduction. Lastly, there is third degree AV block, which is synonymous with complete heart block, where there is complete AV dissociation. So I'm going to touch on my approach to bradycardia. And this is through a systematic history taking, physical examination, focusing on manual assessment of pulse rate and blood pressure, and followed by an ECG where available, and further laboratory investigations and ECG monitors as clinically indicated. History taking is vital as with all conditions. The first step I suggest to do is to stop 
consider if the bradycardia you suspect is age appropriate. For example, if you see a 20 year old military recruit who is running marathons monthly and presents with a sinus bradycardia of 45 beats per minute, this is most likely physiological. Following which, we should inquire on symptoms such as tiredness, lethargy, some of these symptoms overlap with hypothyroidism. Sinister symptoms of syncope or near syncope, if present, should be evalu evaluated or elaborated further. Determining the situation around a syncope episode with or without prodrome during exercise or positional changes, which allows us to better stratify the risk of further syncopes. Sometimes, patient presents with bradycardia and they also complain of palpitations. This may suggest an underlying tachybrady syndrome and most often atrial fibrillation with post-conversion pauses. Of course, we also discussed on the possible causes on the previous slides and it's important to keep those systemic diseases in mind and ask about suggested symptoms. Hypothyroidism, sleep apnea, neuromuscular disorders, fever. It is uncommon for infections to affect the conduction system. For example, Lyme disease and sometimes infective endocarditis. Physical examination follows the same train of thought from history taking. Again, I emphasize on manually taking the vital signs as ventricular atopics can cause erroneous readings, which is factitious bradycardia. Clinical examination is often otherwise unyielding and should be guided by clinical suspicion of systemic diseases. The first picture on the left is a malar rash suggestive of systemic lupus erythematosus. The middle picture is lupus perneo, suggestive of sarcoidosis. The last two pictures on the right side shows hypothyroidism myxedema facies with a dull puffy facial expression, dry skin, periorbital swelling, hair that is dry, coarse and sparse. And the rightmost picture shows following treatment with thyroxin. Laboratory investigations are also guided by clinical suspicion and this list is non-exhaustive. The more commonly ordered tests would be a thyroid function test and electrolytes. Some acid-based disturbances can also cause bradycardias. And if you suspect any autoimmune diseases or ongoing infections, Further lab tests are also justified, including a chest x-ray. In terms of cardiac investigations, an ECG is pivotal as an initial stage to guide further investigations. If there is already complete heart block at baseline, the diagnosis is clear and this patient needs to be referred for consideration of a pacemaker. However, in the majority of cases, the ECG is unyielding and may show normal sinus rhythm or just sinus bradycardia. Hence, longer periods of monitoring may be useful to capture episodic bradycardias. These devices include holter, handheld ECG machines, many of which are already commercially available, patch holters which function like a holter device, a now increasingly common are watches with ECG monitoring capabilities. Sometimes we also offer implantable loop recorders for patients with very episodic and infrequent events, but this will involve an invasive procedure. If there are suspicions of an underlying structural cardiac disease, an echocardiogram, and even a cardiac MRI or PET scan can be done. We now move on to some case studies which will serve to reinforce some of the principles we have discussed earlier. The first case is a 26-year-old female with no past medical history of note. She is not on any medications and she was referred for a low pulse rate. She does have symptoms of feeling tired and lethargic for the past few months. Physical examination was unremarkable laboratory investigations including a thyroid function test and electrolytes were all within normal limits.
This is an ECG which was recorded at the time of consult. It shows normal sinus rhythm with ventricular atopics in a bigeminy pattern. A transthoracic echocardiogram showed a structurally normal heart with normal left ventricular ejection fraction of 60% with normal valves. A holter showed a high PVC or ventricular atopics burden of 28%. She was started on a trial of beta blockers which she could not tolerate and she then underwent an electrophysiology study with ablation. We were successful in ablating this ventricular atopic over the coronary cusps. A follow-up halter showed a reduced burden of PVCs to 1%. Hence, this is a case of factitious bradycardia as a result of ventricular atopics. Summarizing this talk, I've touched on the definition of bradycardia, recognizing some of the physiological states that we need to be wary of. We've also learned some of the pitfalls which can lead us to an erroneous diagnosis of bradycardia. We've learned some of the causes and different types of bradycardia, a general approach to bradycardia, and I've also touched on some case studies to help us reinforce some of the principles learned in this talk. I hope you have understood more about bradycardia from this talk and thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.